<clears throat> Welcome back. What a moving lunch in honoring two American heroes. We hope you enjoyed yourself, and we thank Boeing again for co-sponsoring our Hill Award Luncheon. The leadership of Neil Armstrong and Sally Ride would be reflected in the energy and inspiration of our next panel. Earlier this week, the Space Generation Advisory Council conducted their second annual fusion forum. This forum for young space professionals proceeded to start at the National Space Symposium. The Space Foundation is very pleased to host the fusion forum and to also conduct a number of activities throughout the week as part of the, of the new generation initiatives. To hear just a little bit about the Fusion Forum, we are pleased to welcome to the stage Ms. Andre Jaime Albalat, the Executive Director of the SGAC, and Mr. Stephen Ringler, the Fusion Forum Manager. Thanks, thanks Captain Tander for the, for the introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. First of all, let me congratulate the Space Foundation for another great National Space Symposium, and also thank them uh, to give the Space Generation Advisory Council the opportunity to introduce to all of you uh, the, the event uh, that Captain Chandler just mentioned, the Space Generation Fusion Forum. My name is Andrea Jaime, and I am the Executive Director of the Space Generation Advisory Council. For those who are not familiar with uh, SGC, with this organization, uh, we're an, a non-profit organization that came out of the United Nations in 1999 to represent young professionals and students in the space sector. Now, 14 years later, we, re we represent more than 4,000 members from more than 100 countries from all, of, uh, from all around the world. We like to call ourselves the next generation of space leaders. SGAC gives scholarships, scholarships uh, work on different projects, has a permanent observer status at the United Nations Committee of Peaceful Uses of, for Outer Space, and participates in many, many other activities. We also have two main annual events, the Space Generation Congress, which is held in conjunction with the International Astronautical Congress, and the one that we are introducing to all of you today, which is obviously held in conjunction with the National Space Symposium. So we just held the second edition of the Fusion Forum, Space Generation Fusion Forum. Uh, the, it was actually last weekend, and we bring uh, 50 delegates from 16 different countries, 60% male, 40% female, not bad. The second edition of the Space Generation Fusion Forum gathered, as I said, top 50 young adults. The event this year was driven by, by four uh, key space topics. The delegates were addressed by high-level speakers, like, um, well, that they took the time to come to speak, to just uh, mingle with us, and give this introduction to these four speakers. For example, as an example, we had uh, Professor Warner, Leroy Chao, Marcy Rangelo, and many others. But what really, really makes uh, the Fusion Forum a unique event is that the delegates uh, were part of interactive panels moderated by international space sector leaders. So in this case, it's us, the young professionals, who bring up on the stage new perspectives and very dynamic discussions. The event also promoted the international networking among all delegates, but also between the delegates and the special guests and speakers. We actually have put a brief video to show to all of you uh, just two minutes of uh, what the event was about. First of all, I want to, to just say something. SGAC works on a volunteer basis, so we are all volunteers, as I said, from all around the world. And in fact, the video that you are going to see now uh, was just prepared by Tu Vu, our member from Vietnam. So well, I hope you, you really enjoy. So video, please.
So now I would like to turn it over to Steve uh, Ringler, manager of the Fusion Forum this year, uh, who's going to provide a brief summary of the results of the event. So please, Steve. Thank you, Andrea. So have you ever wondered if you're going to be able to retire? Well, I've got good news for you today. The bottom line results of the Space Generation Fusion Forum is that you, the space leaders of today, can indeed retire. Now, I'm not talking about 401ks. I'm not talking about beachfront retirement homes. I'm talking about retiring with confidence. Confidence that you can, confidence that you will be leaving the space industry in good and capable hands. That you, the space industry leaders of today, who influence, mentor, and invest in the next generation future leaders, are making a significant impact in the long-term sustainability of our space sector. So much of what is being discussed here on this main stage at National Space Symposium are the same things that we discussed at the Fusion Forum this past weekend. In particular, we focused on four key areas. The first, benefits and risks of regional space programs. We tackled questions such as, would more regional space programs benefit our industry and our global society and economics and economies? Number two, we looked at the topic of long-term sustainability of space. What is it that we need to invest in today to ensure our industry going forward in the future? Third, we looked at innovative space exploration strategies. How do we commercialize robotic and human space exploration? And fourth, we looked at operational data exchange and sharing of space assets. Are there more efficient, cost-effective ways to utilize our space assets? The Fusion Forum took a unique approach in debating and discussing these four topics. As Andrea mentioned, and as you've seen on the video, we had four panels comprised of next generation professionals and students, moderated by space industry leaders. Our moderators engaged not only the panels, but also the audience in an interactive and sometimes quite contentious discussion. Our delegates brought forth new, fresh, and innovative ideas to consider. One particularly interesting discussion that we had that was had by our panelists and our audience alike surrounded the lack of medical knowledge that we currently have in how humans fare in deep space. So given some of these particular concerns, the panel overall agreed that human space exploration should be pursued rationally, thoughtfully, and pragmatically. Now it's impossible for me in this amount of time to share with you all the highlights and all the results of the Fusion Forum but I do want to encourage you to do three things with the information that Andrea and myself, and the, as the video showed. Um, the first is, look for complete details of the Fusion Forum and our final report, which is due to be released sometime this summer. You can download that report from the Space Generation Advisory Council website. Second, before leaving NSS, pull aside one of the new geners and talk to us about the Fusion Forum. Ask us about it. Ask us about the new generation uh, leaders program put on by the National Space Symposium. And if you have trouble recognizing us, I've got two suggestions. The first is this little pin here that Andrew and I are both sporting. Good chance that it's a young professional because our club is for 35 and under. The second, if you don't see a pin, look for things like soul patches or sideburns. I mean, who knows? Maybe we played drums in a rock band on the side. I mean, really, when we colonize Mars, there's gonna be rock and roll, right? <laughs> Third, when you get back to work in the coming weeks, provide the opportunity for one young professional to go to one, one high-level meeting to be a fly on the wall that they would normally not be invited to. Trust me, not only will they be grateful for the opportunity and will learn a lot, You'll also get to put it in your performance review as mentoring, so it's win-win for, for both sides. So I wanted to say thank you to the Space Generation Advisory Council, in particular, Andrea Jaime, for giving me this opportunity to lead such a one-of-a-kind young professional conference. I want to thank our Space Generation sponsors for making the event possible, as you saw them listed in the video a moment ago. 
And a very special thank you to the Space Foundation uh, for hosting our Fusion Forum for a second, and I hope for a third year in a row. We could not do this without the awesome uh, team that the Space Foundation uh, we worked with who clearly believes in the next generation. So I wanna say a special thanks, uh, give them a special round of applause for all their hard work. Before we get off the stage, we'd like to quickly introduce a few of the all-stars from our Space Generation Fusion Forum event. A main goal of the Space Generation Fusion Forum is to provide firsthand international perspectives at the US event. Space Generation Advisory Council is enabling this through its global grant program. This year we awarded six scholarships competed amongst a large pool of outstanding applicants for a fully paid trip to the Fusion Forum as well as National Space Symposium. And the winners of the global grant program each participated in one of the four panels. So we'd like to recognize the outstanding six participants and ask them to join us here on the stage. So I would like to call Yusuke Muraki from Japan, Alana Krolikovsky from Canada, Pascal Renten from Germany, Joyita Chatterjee from India, Rose Finley from United Kingdom, and Tubu from Vietnam. So here you see the future international space leaders. Okay, like last year. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Okay. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you. Now is the heads of a space agency. <laughs> uh, thank you, and congratulations, Andrea and Stephen, and all of the winners. Let's have another round of applause for all of our. Fusion Forum participants. And Andrea, I can guarantee a third Fusion Forum. At this time, I'd like to invite our next panel to the stage. As they come up, a few comments. As it's been noted throughout this week, the Space Symposium has been the broadest international participation ever. The Space Foundation is particularly honored to have several top space agency leaders join us now to share information about their agency space programs and their perspectives on global collaboration. To lead the discussion among such a notable group of leaders, we are very pleased to welcome to the Space Foundation Dr. Yasushi Horikawa, the chairman of the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. Dr. Horikawa also serves as a technical counselor for the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency in Tokyo and has contributed to successful meteorological and Earth observation satellite programs and the International Space Station program. I've been personally honored to know Dr. Horikawa through the Space Foundation's work with UN COPUS and can also attest to his tremendous diplomatic skills in addition to his engineering accomplishments. Dr. Horikawa, welcome back to the Space Symposium and we look forward to your panel. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. As introduced, uh, I'm Yasushi Horikawa, I'm current chairman of the United Nations Committee on Peaceful Use of Outer Space, in short, UN Corpus. It is such an honor to be invited by the Space Foundation to moderate this important panel attended brilliant panelists 
from around the world. Last year, my predecessor, Dr. Doreen Prunario, moderated this panel. So as a heritage, I am pleased to succeed it. I would like to thank the Space Foundation for giving me, giving me this opportunity to be here. Especially, I would express my appreciation to Mr. Elliot Pruham and Mr. Stephen Eisenhardt, who uh, kindly advised me for the preparation of this panel. Unfortunately, this year, we are missing the presence of NASA due to the difficulties shared by some of us to you. a certain degree. But this morning, we had some announcement made by Mr. Uh, Charles Baldwin from NASA. I'll touch upon this later. And today, we have benefits of having the presence of outstanding representative of very important space agencies. I expect that they will provide us valuable information and or comments on the topics about their progress and future perspectives on the collaboration in space activities. At first, I would like to introduce today distinguished panelists in alphabetical order. First, from my left uh, right, Dr. Jean-Jacques Dodan, Director General of the European Space Agency, ESA. Mr. Hideshi Kozawa, Executive Advisor to the President, the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, JAXA. Dr. Hal Newport, Director of the Netherlands Space Office. Dr. Johann Dietrich Werner, Chairman of the Executive Board of the German Aerospace Center, DLR. Before hearing from each panelist, let me lay the groundwork for today's panel discussion. The UN COPAS has been at the center of humankind's efforts to peacefully explore and utilize the outer space environment with the objective of bringing the benefit of space science and technology and their applications to contribute to the social development of all countries. My role as the chairman of the UN COPAS is to lead to consensus among the UN COPAS members, states, on the international cooperation, promoting the development of space science and technology and of its applications, fostering the development of relevant and appropriate space capabilities in interested states, and facilitating the exchange of expertise and technology among states, while taking into account the needs of developing countries. Space science and technology and their applications, such as satellite communications, Earth observations and meteorological systems and satellite navigation services provide indispensable tools for viable long-term solutions for sustainable development and can contribute more effectively to promote the development of all countries and regions of the world to improve people's lives, health, and security to preserve natural resources and to enhance the preparedness for and mitigation of the consequence of disasters. In addition, we should consider human challenges to the space exploration as a test bed for future human presence in space together with a variety of microgravity experiments. Current International Space Station program is considered to be the largest international cooperative project which has ever been achieved. Furthermore, 
We should also remember the recent remarkable achievement made by NASA, Mars Curiosity Program. As clearly exhibited here, space science will bring us the astonishing dream and genuine curiosity. On the other hand, we are living in the era of space becoming increasingly crowded with new players. The need to show strong commitment to bear shared responsibility and act responsibly in space to help prevent mishaps, misperceptions, and mistrust has never been greater. Today, we are deeply concerned about the fragility of the space environment and faced by the challenges to realize the long-term sustainability of outer space activities. Our goal is to ensure the safe and sustainable use of outer space over many years by future generations. For this goal, we need true global cooperation and understanding. This forum provides us the great opportunity for enhancing such international cooperation by giving us the talk about various future perspectives from space agencies' leaders and promoting understanding among ourselves. With this in mind, I would like to invite our distinguished panelists to discuss their current status or progress and future perspectives on the collaborations in space activities. I will ask each panelist to express their views. After all, panelists' remarks finished, I will take a few questions from the floor. So first speaker, I will invite uh, Dr. Janjak Dodan. Uh, you have the floor. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very glad to be back here uh, in this uh, symposium. Taking what you said, uh, Monsieur Horikawa, I would like to start by saying that uh, international cooperation is our daily business at ESA. We don't know what is not cooperation because uh, all what we are doing is uh, cooperation among the 20 member states of ESA. So it's already international cooperation. But we are also cooperating with the other European countries, not yet member of ESA, and also Canada, who is an important uh, uh, partner for ESA. Cooperation with the European Union also, cooperation with European industry and operators. And when I am speaking of operators, it's telecom operators and also UMETSAT for meteorology. And also, obviously, cooperation with international partners, starting with NASA, which is uh, by far our longest partner. Uh, we are cooperating with NASA since uh, day one of uh, ESA. But also Russia, Japan, China, India, and many others. So just to say that uh, uh, all what we are doing is uh, international cooperation. And I can report as a director general of ESA, as I said many times, cooperation is difficult. It's always easier not to cooperate, but uh, we are demonstrating every day that uh, cooperation is also successful. Successful, and I would like to highlight some of the last uh, results that we got. Uh, first, successful in science, and what we call science of, in ESA is science of the universe, science of the solar system, and. Uh, science of planet Earth also. And uh, uh, obviously the, the last uh, very important event in terms of science uh, is the, the disclosure on the 21st of March of the first data of the uh, uh, Planck mission. Uh, Planck is uh, a spacecraft which have been launched uh, uh, four years ago now and uh, which, has, which is providing uh, unprecedented accuracy on the origins of the universe. I hope that you have all seen the old sky picture taken by Planck. Given, uh, uh, given uh, uh, again, uh, uh, an improvement uh, compared to the last mission WMAP, uh, 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 an improvement of a factor of 20 uh, for uh, the data uh, concerning the origins of the universe. But it's also success in uh, services, and just to take last year, we have launched 
the four first Galileo satellites. And uh, we have also disclosed uh, in March, uh, one month ago, the, the first uh, results of the localization made uh, by these four satellites. And uh, this uh, localization shows a very good accuracy. Uh, acknowledged and even publicized by the users. Uh, and this is certainly a very good start in uh, the future uh, uh, services to be delivered by uh, Galileo. We have launched also last year two meteorology satellites, uh, uh, one in uh, geostationary orbit, uh, met, uh, MSG3, and one in polar orbit, METOP B. Last year, again, uh, we have, uh, uh, have the first launch of the new uh, launch vehicle, uh, Vega, meaning that uh, we are now exploiting three launchers uh, from uh, the uh, French Guiana, uh, Ariane 5, Soyuz, and Vega, meaning that we have uh, the full range of uh, launch services now available from uh, uh, French Guiana and operated by Ariane Espace. We have had also the third launch of the ATV. Uh, now we are producing and uh, we are launching ATV on a yearly basis demonstrating the, the, the capabilities of uh, European industry. And, uh, and more is to come. I cannot speak of success, because uh, they are still to be done, but uh, we shall have the next launch of Vega on the 2nd of May, three weeks from now. Next launch of ATV on the 5th of June. The launch of uh, the telecommunication satellite AlphaSat in July, which is a public-private partnership with the operator uh, uh, Idmarsat. We shall have the continuation of the launch of Galileo in September, to, and I am committed to have launched 18 satellites of uh, Galileo by end of 2014. And we shall have the start of the uh, constellation uh, related to uh, services for environment and security, which is now called Copernicus. The first launch of Sentinel will take place also at the end of the year. I would not like to forget uh, the next science mission, Gaia, which uh, will uh, provide uh, uh, from next year uh, a cartography of uh, the stars of the universe. So that is to speak of the missions, uh, uh, but uh, I would like to uh, finish by the uh, Council at ministerial level, which took place on the 20th and 21st of November uh, last year. Uh, the Council at ministerial level at ESA are always an important event because this is uh, during this Council that the 20 member states are taking decisions for several years. And I must say that uh, this Council at ministerial level has been uh, a success in spite of the economic uh, situation. I would like even, I dare to say that thanks to the economic uh, situation because uh, I think that uh, uh, we have demonstrated at the council, at the last council at ministerial level, that space has now entered in Europe uh, in the economic dimension, meaning that uh, space is not anymore for the uh, finance minister uh, an expense, but an investment into the economy. And uh, that uh, is certainly an important milestone that we have taken. Uh, investing in space is investing into competitiveness and growth. So the three objectives that uh, have been uh, uh, implemented by the Council at ministerial level is uh, knowledge, and we have got uh, uh, important decisions to continue the, the, the science uh, missions and uh, with uh, uh, the selection of a solar orbiter, Euclid and JUICE as the three next uh, science missions of ESA. Uh, we have also uh, got uh, important decisions on the continuation of the Earth science and the series of Earth explorers, and also the continuation of ISS exploitation. In terms of uh, competitiveness, which was the second objective, uh, there was decisions on the telecommunications, and especially the development of new platforms and uh, electric uh, propulsion uh, telecommunication platform. 
development of new launch services with the uh, uh, continuation of the development of the new version of Ariane 5, Ariane 5 ME, and uh, uh, the definition studies of a new uh, Ariane, Ariane 6. And the third uh, objective was the uh, services with the decisions to develop the second generation of meteorology uh, uh, satellites in polar orbit but also the next generation of Galileo already, and also the uh, speaking of the uh, services for environment and security, uh, the, the development of Sentinel-5 and JSON-CS. So, as you can see, uh, we have now a roadmap for the next uh, four to five years. I would not like to close by uh, uh, forgetting that uh, speaking of international cooperation, among the decisions taken by the member states, there was the decision to uh, contribute to the uh, uh, multi-purpose crew vehicle, uh, meaning that we shall uh, provide the service module of uh, the Orion capsule for a first launch in 2017. And that decision is uh, certainly opening a new chapter of cooperation between NASA and ESA. And uh, discussions are already starting with uh, NASA to see how we can develop uh, uh, more cooperation and especially on the recently announced new initiative uh, taken by uh, NASA uh, for going to an asteroid. We have also uh, uh, completed the uh, agreement uh, on the implementation of ExoMars with Russia and there also I have got from uh, Charlie Bolden the uh, commitment that NASA will also contribute to ExoMars, which is uh, certainly uh, good news. So, as you can see, international cooperation is our daily business, but uh, we are uh, reinforcing this uh, cooperation at each uh, uh, step of our uh, history, I would say. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Jean-Jacques, uh, for your talk about uh, your promissive uh, mission and program future. Uh, we appreciate it. And next speaker is uh, Mr. Hideshi Kozawa from JAXA. You have the floor. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, introduction of myself. Uh, as I introduced, my name is Hideshi Kozawa. No, no, he has uh, executive been. advisor to the president of the, the JAXA Japanese and Space I Agencies. I go to the I'm very happy to be here Switching. and talk about the uh, newest JAXA status and uh, outline of the JAXA international corporations. Uh, the first uh, big news uh, about the JAXA at this point is the uh, on this uh, April, JAXA president has been changed. Dr. Tachikawa has been working the JAXA president uh, for about more than five, uh, eight years, and he retired from JAXA, and then newly uh, president was assigned by the government. Uh, his name is uh, Dr. Naoki Okumura, new president for JAXA. Uh, he was the executive vice president of Japanese steel company until 2007. And after that, he became a member, executive member of the Council for Science and Technology Policy of the Japanese government we call CSTP. So he is one of the big leaders on the science and technology policy field in Japan. Now we have the, uh, this uh, big leaders as the JAXA president. I hope uh, with this uh, strong leadership, he will lead JAXA activities. And uh, second topics at this point is the uh, JAXA enter the new mid-term period. JAXA is implementing agencies of Japanese space policies. And so every five years, JAXA requested to, uh, by government to make a plan to implement space, Japanese space policy as JAXA programs. So JAXA was established in the 2003, and for one decade we have spent the, the two uh, midterm periods. So now we are in the third midterm period. We call this plan midterm plans, 
And this plan, in this year, in March, the government approved, and uh, this plan has been activated from the uh, first of this month. And now I'd like to cover the major you know, programs in this uh, plan. First, the earth observation programs. Uh, in this five years, we are going to launch the three JAX satellite. First one is the uh, Learning Observatory satellite, which has the urban radars, ALOS-2. And also, we have the uh, mission to monitor the ground surface and the atmospheres, the satellite named the, the GCOM-C. And also, we have the uh, second uh, greenhouse gas observing satellite, GOSAT-2. In addition to those uh, JAXA satellites, we have the uh, two uh, international programs. One is the, uh, we participating in NASA GPM programs with providing the uh, precipitation ladders. This GPM satellite uh, will be launched by the Japanese launch vehicle H28 this year. And also, uh, we participated in ESA ASCARE programs uh, providing the crowd radar sensors. And for the space science and the space explorations uh, programs, in this uh, five years, we will launch the, uh, several uh, satellites. For example, Sprint A, this is the uh, planetary observing satellite. And Hayabusa 2, this is the Japanese second uh, asteroid explorers. And Astro H, X ray astronomy satellite. And uh, for geospace exploration missions, we launched the ERG. And also, we have the international cooperation with ESA. We participated in ESA VEP Colombo programs with providing MMO satellite. And now, we are going to have the new launcher. We have almost finished the, uh, this uh, development of these new launch vehicles, named Epsilon rocket. And this is the three-stage uh, solid rocket, and the first launch is planned in this summer, uh, launch that uh, uh, Sprint A satellite. Now, I'd like to cover a little bit about the outline of the Japanese in, uh, JAXA, the international corporations. We have two categories of our international corporations. One is the uh, corporations with traditional partners like NASA, ESA, DLR, and CRANS, ASI, so many uh, partners in the world. And the other one is the uh, international corporations with Asians or other regional countries. For the uh, corporations with traditional partners, we have the very good relations and we have long histories and as a multilateral programs, we have participating in the ISS programs, and also we are participating in the discussions in the ISEG for the future space exploration programs. We have lots of bilateral programs in various areas. And for the Asian or region countries' corporations, we have bilateral corporations in Earth observation and so on. In addition to that, especially for the Asian countries, we have the uh, Forum, uh, which is the APRSF, Asian Pacific Regional Space Agency Forum. We will have the uh, annual meetings uh, for these forums. For example, last year we have the, uh, this forum in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. We have more than 380 participants from the 33 countries and 14 uh, international organizations. We opened this forum to everyone in the regionals. Government, government institutions, universities, private sector, space agencies, of course, and uh, other uh, related agencies. And from this APR stuff, we initiated several uh, uh, projects, like uh, Sentinel Asia's, uh, which is the uh, data delivering systems for the uh, disasters cases. These initiatives uh, is making the good contributions for the local uh, problems and the providing the solutions. So uh, international cooperations for JAXA is very important. We would like to continue to this type of the cooperation and enhance it. Thank you very much.
thank you, Mr. Kozawa, for your presentation. So now you enter new era with a new president. Yes. I hope you have a great success. <laughs> thank you very much. Can I much. have your uh, chat? Yeah. It's here. It's okay. Okay, sir. Oh, okay. You have. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Harold Newport, Director of the Netherlands Space Offices. You have the floor. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the Netherlands Space Office is the space agency of the Netherlands, a small agency of a small country. Therefore, there is no other way for us than to cooperate and to specialize in markets, in niches of the, of the space market. The Netherlands is one of the founding members of ESA. Our cooperation, cooperation activities mainly took place in the ESA framework. Our main objective in the 60s was to secure the leading position of Dutch astronomy. Since then, science has been the driver behind space activities in the Netherlands. But the world is changing, and space in the Netherlands is changing with it. At the start of the space era, John F. Kennedy said, we choose to go to the moon, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. Now we go into space, not because it's hard, but because it's extremely useful. In our vision, space is in a transition, transition phase in which technology-driven is more and more replaced by user-driven. Space will become an integral part of the inter information society. Space data, integrated in geo-information, are essential with respect to major global challenges like the effects of climate change, food security, water scarcity, disaster management. Space data, in combination with geo-information, will also be one of the drivers of the future economy. But that can only become reality when the space sector will be driven by user needs, when the added value of space activities will lead the way. To reap all benefits space can bring to us, we need a truly commercial space market. This will only happen when space agencies play a vital role in stimulating the development of such a market. Space for science and exploration will always be the domain of space agencies. But space transportation, telecommunication, earth observation can be done more effective and cheaper in the market environment. NASA has made a start with the development of the CCDEF program. That was a major step forward to introduce a more commercial approach in space, but more is needed. What can a small country like the Netherlands contribute in this respect? Until now, the Netherlands was primarily focused on European cooperation in an institutional context. Our technology development was mainly focused on contributing to high-end high institutional missions, for example, instruments for astrophysics, atmospheric and planetary research, one-offs. After completion, the technology remained in the institutional environment, and we went on to the next exciting project. In the future, we still develop our technology within the ESA framework, and institutional scientific missions will remain important. But we will broaden our scope. We take other user needs into account as well. One reason for being is being able to find budget elsewhere. In our institutional one-off setting, the Dutch space sector was very dependent on the Dutch space budget, subject to political whims, as we noticed recently. Therefore, we do need more commercial activities to strengthen our industry. This will also, also lead to a broader scope for international cooperation. Another reason to broaden our scope is that the Netherlands has a lot of heritage in scientific instruments, as I said. For example, in atmospheric instruments like OMI on the EOS Aura mission, and now with TROPOMI as a Sentinel-5 precursor mission. The Netherlands also plays a leading role in astrophysical instruments, for example, recently with HIFI on the Ursula Planck mission. The instrument technologies behind these and other missions provide stepping stones towards instrumentation for more commercial, commercial missions in Earth observation. We are now bringing together the scientific and technology institutes and the companies developing instruments in the platform to stimulate further development of instrumentation for commercial use. We also spin in technology from outside space, for, like radar technology, where there is huge potential for commercial viable missions. In the Netherlands, we have many companies developing space applications in areas like atmospheric services, agriculture, agriculture water management, dike monitoring, etc. These companies provide input via specific user needs. Based on these discussions, it is clear that for many business cases, the present data available on the market are not sufficient. More is needed. Next to big monitoring systems like GMES, there will be a place for smaller commercial missions targeted to the specific user needs. 
The next step is therefore to integrate the chain from the instrument to the end user. The start is the information need of end users, which of course must be willing to pay for the data. The business case should be there, and for that the cost of the mission has to be affordable. This will lead to small satellite missions with relatively low cost, a short time to market, etc. The technology for these small satellite missions should be mature. The instrument itself is the key to the chain and it should be tailored for specific needs. But what can a small country like the Netherlands contribute in this respect? Um, in the relatively short time since we started, we made uh, progress. Uh, I will highlight two developments. The first is a small X-band FMCW radar targeted for, for use on a microsatellite with relatively low power use. It is a resolution close to one meter with a relatively small SWAT width and other modes with large, larger SWATs and lower resolutions. It seems a rather good performance for such a small instrument, costing only a fraction of the bi bigger radar emissions. An orbit demonstration is foreseen in 2015. You can tailor such an instrument to a wide variety of services, but based on discussions till now with service providers, the start is with business cases in ice monitoring, oil spills, and dike monitoring, very important for the Netherlands. The second development I want to mention concerns small hyperspectral and thermal images. The instruments are small, 20 by 20 by 20 centimeters, between 2 and 10 kilos, and have resolutions between 30 and 50 meters. Also here, uh, discussions with uh, uh, application development show that, that there are, are a lot of um, business cases in which uh, it can play a useful role. The initial business case it will be developed for is in agriculture. To harvest the wide potential of these and other instrument projects, cooperation is a key issue, not only within the Netherlands, not only within ESA, but also with other international partners. Discussions about cooperation, for example, with US companies are ongoing. The new focus of our space policy is giving new opportunities to our space industry, as well upstream as downstream. I really hope that these developments will contribute to a more commercial space market. Only a commercial space market can transform the space sector into a vital pillar of our information society. Thank you. I thank the Dr. Newport. Uh, about your uh, programs, uh, especially for the uh, various instruments in space. Uh, thank you very much. And now I write down to Dr. Johann Dietrich Werner, Chairman of the Executive Board of the German Aerospace Center. You have the floor. Yes, thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, especially next generation space leaders, uh, it's a big honor and a pleasure for me to talk a little bit about the subject, but I will not go to t talk about DLR plans and uh, German uh, space program. I will discuss, and I would like to discuss a little bit uh, about some general remarks concerning space. Space is really a complicated matter, also it looks like sometimes in movies that it's rather easy. Space. The final frontier. I will not go for further, you know it. <laughs> but what is behind it? We have a pressure of legitimation of space activities. We have to face it. Space activities in general are sometimes discussed in the public. I mean, here we are all baptized for space. But if you go out, you will also find some critics about criticism about it. Exploration is a very special field where people are asking for taxpayers' money and especially in Germany, also human spaceflights are always um, questioned. And the way we are usually working in space is shown on this picture. We are looking for some questions. What are we doing? How are we doing it? Who is doing it, together or alone? When are we doing it? But the main question for all of this is the why question. And therefore, I would like to ask all of you in the future not to start with your projects, which are nice, but to start first with the why question. And ask the people, would you like to have weather and climate on time information and forecast? Would you like to have concrete information to optimize fertilization and irrigation in agriculture? Measures to manage disasters on Earth, man-made, natural, asteroids, solar flare, worldwide communication, individual and public? Would you like to have navigation as a day-to-day -day support? Would you like to have better treatment for diseases and biomedical malfunctions? Production of new materials for better performance? 
Would you like to understand our world from Big Bang over today to the future of the universe? And the answer is simple, usually yes. You get it all through space activities. But the why question was sometimes differently answered. First of all, again, why is the first question? And then how, when, what, who? And not the other way around. And we can follow this line very, uh, very strictly by saying the why question is the challenge, the motivation. The how question is the method. Hopefully, with a young generation, disruptive ideas, as we heard today from NASA with the asteroid lasso plan. And then the realization through technology and partners. And if you look to this again, then it means we have to change our uh, paradigm. We have to put the proactive process chain at the beginning instead of a post-justification of why we are doing one or the other. It was different in the past. It looks like different in the past. If you look to John F. Kennedy and Khrushchev, and of course, the most famous uh, speech of John F. Kennedy, I believe this nation should commit itself, and so on. But if you look to the first part of it, he did not say, we go to the moon because I think it's good. He said, I believe this nation should commit itself. So he answered the why question first, and then he was saying what he is doing. However, the world today is different. Today we have the global challenges. We are happy not to have the Cold War. And these global challenges, these are the why questions we have to use. And with these, all these why questions, we then use our different methods in space for Earth observation, for technology development, communication, uh, navigation, zero-g research, exploration, science. So all of this can be done. And of course, it's very simple. Hope, and it is simple, it, and that is good. We can show that there are really very good results from all these activities. Oh, I have to go back one. Is that possible? One gag? To the uh, one? Yes, okay. For instance, disaster management. It's a global corporation. And many uh, uh, lives were uh, saved by the co cooperation of different space agencies across the world. And I could show now a list of very successful missions and very successful impacts on what we are doing. I would just like to mention uh, three of them. There is the impact of innovation. Electric mobility is one of the subjects of today's discussion. And if you look back to the moon, there was electric mobility. OK, now we can do better, as you see on the right hand side, with our uh, Robomobile from DLR. The next movie I will show you is even a little bit more complicated. It comes from the robotic thing, things we were developing for space. And we use this together with medical doctors for a para paraplegic woman. Believe it or not, she was totally paraplegic from the neck downwards. She could not move, but due to the possibilities of modern technology, you see a sensor in her head over there. There is a sensor measuring her brain, and she is now moving the robotic arm, and for the first time in her life, she could drink by herself. So this is a way where we can transform also space activities into really advantages for human life. But of course, science is also, again back please, uh, science is also a, a very uh, important thing. Uh, Jean-Jacques Dondin mentioned it, he mentioned uh, the very nice results of Planck. We can also mention the results of AMS, which were published some days ago, and show that there is really a big amount of antimatter in our universe. Um, positrons were found in a big amount. So there is something, and this is to understand our world from Big Bang over today to the future of the universe. However, as I mentioned, human spaceflight, this is always the, the most important and most difficult aspect to be discussed. For general aspects of human space rights, you find a lot of arguments, and we should not look for arguments, we should again turn it around. It's, it's human heritage not to live in caves, but to go out, to go across the next valley, across, across the ocean, to Mount Everest or wherever, and also to go to space. So it's, it's a human heritage. International cooperation is, of course, human space flights, biomedical research, public outage, direct and indirect impact, and I could show you a big number. But now we are discussing also about human space explorations. That means going beyond LEO, going to uh, 
another planet, a moon, or an asteroid, or whatever. And we have to raise the question again, what is the why for that? And uh, the why question is reduced a little bit in that case, because the cultural heritage of human curiosity and pioneering is still the strongest one, but also public outreach. And as a conclusion of my presentation, I will show you another movie. It is a commercial. Officially in Germany, it's not political correct. But I will show it because uh, I think it shows a little bit what we can do also with human spaceflight if we do it correctly. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Werner, for your thoughtful <laughs> presentation. <laughs> uh, thank you all for your informative contribution to this panel. Uh, still, we have uh, 15 minutes. So before taking questions from the floor, let me ask some questions to the distinguished panelists. First, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Uh, Newport, in order to contribute to the human society from space, as just mentioned by uh, Dr. Werner, what could be the contribution from your agency to enhance future space activities around the world? What are the key elements or factors, do you think? Well, as I said, we are a small country and we have to specialize. And I think we have, as I said, we have a lot of instrument technology, so we could contribute to a lot of global challenges with our instrument technology and what we are doing now. For example, with the building of uh, the troponin instrument, uh, it will lead to uh, more information, more data uh, on areas like cl uh, climate change, uh, uh, ozone monitoring, uh, and so on. Uh, but also the development of small hyper hyper in instruments like the hyperspectral and the radar can also contribute not only to global challenges, but can also bring a lot of uh, economic activities uh, uh, which can not only for the space uh, uh, community itself, but also in agriculture and in water, uh, water and, 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 and food are the main global challenges we are facing in the future. And I think uh, these type of instruments can also contribute uh, to this uh, type of solution. So in a small way, we can contribute uh, to, to, the, to those areas. Thank you, Dr. Newport. Uh, we all agree with you. And uh, uh, I would like to ask uh, a question. As I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, this morning, uh, Mr. Charles Bolden of NASA announced about the a new mission to the asteroid retrieval uh, mission. Uh, so. Uh, Firstly, I would like to ask uh, uh, three space agencies, ESA, JAXA, and DLR, what is your impression or uh, feeling uh, for this announcement? Uh, can I ask to Mr. Dodan? Okay, yes, uh, certainly. Uh, uh, I think that uh, this is a very interesting uh, project. Uh, and. Uh, and, uh, and as already uh, told uh, Charlie Bolden, uh, we are more than uh, ready to see uh, how uh, ESA can, uh, can contribute to such a mission. Uh, I said the, the decision taken by the member states and especially uh, uh, led by Germany at the last council at ministerial level on the service module of MPCV is opening a new chapter in our uh, cooperation with uh, NASA. And that new chapter is uh, certainly related to what can we do together for exploration programs. So uh, uh, 
uh, within this exploration program, a mission to, to an asteroid, and uh, uh, that initiative is certainly of interest for uh, all of us, uh, starting with ESA. So uh, we are more than ready to discuss with NASA on uh, how we can uh, contribute to such a, uh, any, a project within an overall uh, exploration program, uh, which uh, by definition is an international program. Thank you, Jen Jack. Uh, what about Mr. Ozawa-san? Yes, uh, honestly speaking, it, uh, just we have had that idea. Uh, so we need uh, more details of the information of what NASA is thinking. But uh, the first impression for me, it's a very interesting ideas and concept. And uh, I think that it's worth to discuss uh, among the uh, partners of the fathers. Especially for Japan side, that uh, we have experienced a lot of experience of asteroid mission through the uh, Hayabusa, and uh, it's a good chance for the Japan to present or show the, our technology to other partners. But anyway, that uh, we'd like to discuss uh, this matter as uh, Dora, Dora mentioned that as a wall uh, discussions for the international uh, exploration programs as one of options or ideas, uh, how to incorporate these ideas in the uh, international uh, exploration discussions. So that type of discussion we'd like to continue with the NASA. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kozawa. Uh, what about uh, Dr. Werner? Yes, so first of all, the idea which was presented uh, is, is a disruptive idea, so to, to capture an asteroid to bring it close to the moon, to have it in the moon orbit, and then to fly with astronauts to that asteroid. Everything sounds very nice. It's a pioneering work. It's for sure it will have outreach. But again, I would ask the question why before I do start a new project. For Germany, uh, on the technological base and scientific base, I'm sure that we could have our uh, part in that, either directly as a bilateral partner of NASA or through ESA, as we, as, as we are right now, uh, the uh, cont the. Uh, member state of ESA with the highest contribution since the last ministerial conference. So we are ready on that uh, technological and scientific area. But again, it, it would be very strange if I not ask the why question after my presentation first. <laughs> yes. Uh, can you <laughs> provide us here? <laughs> yes, I, I can tell you at least two um, things are there. It's something like going on, um, on Mount Everest or to the deep sea. It's a pioneering activity, that's for sure. Um, and that means not only to catch and to capture the asteroid, but also to bring it, uh, as they said, asteroid lasso plan, to bring it to the uh, moon. That's for sure, that's an interesting aspect and it will have public outreach, uh, but we have to see is it really, um, is there an additional value which we can transport to people? Um, for instance, could we do the same uh, as a totally robotic mission? That's always the question. As I said, astronauts are really for public outreach. They are the winners of the story, that is fine. But as we know, it costs also some money. So at least the idea not to send the astronaut to the uh, the astronauts to the asteroid, but the asteroid to the astronauts is, at a first glance, a really disruptive idea. But again, uh, to the why question, we have to look into, can we have more than uh, what we have uh, going to other places with astronauts? Yeah. Uh, can yeah. Mr. Just one point, because yes. I was expecting mm -hmm. Jan to say that. Uh, because speaking of technology, uh, next year, we shall dock to a comet. Together, and, uh, Rosetta. Together with <laughs> Germany, uh, with the Rosetta mission. And when I said docking to a comet, it's because it's, we shall not land on that comet, uh, but we shall dock to a comet, and that is certainly a, a technology which could be uh, useful. So I am uh, sorry to intervene there, but I was uh, no, uh, expecting fine. Jan to, to mention that because- I have it on my part. paper, Jean-Jacques, but I thought it better that you say it. <laughs> <laughs> 
No, you, see the, the, you see the result of cooperation. Yes. <laughs> and both of us invite all of you. I'm sure that we have a nice celebration of that landing uh, with a harpoon uh, on Chuyum of Gerasimenko. So please remember the name. And then we will have that next year. In November, I think. Huh? November. Yes. Thank you all for your response. Uh, this will satisfy the curiosity of the audience. And uh, I have uh, uh, several questions hey, from the floor. Uh, one of the questions is, uh, how do you propose to overcome the problem of maintaining international cooperation on long-term projects in such an unstable budget environment? Can I ask the question in the other way? Yeah. How can you overcome an unstable situation without international cooperation? Yeah. <laughs> No, that, uh, that maybe I, I, I can say that because, uh, and I can give the, uh, the experience of ESA. Uh, it's always difficult to, dis to, to start a program at ESA because uh, starting a program at 20 member states, uh, it certainly uh, takes more time, more energy, and more effort. But when the program is decided, this is uh, uh, solid like a rock. Because it's difficult to start a program at ESA, but it's even more difficult to stop a program. Uh, and, uh, and sometimes we can reflect on that, but, uh, but international cooperation consolidate a program because when there is a partnership, uh, that partnership is very solid. And we have seen that also on the International Space Station. There was a lot of tra tragedy, unfortunately, uh, in the history of the International Space Station. But because it was a partnership, because of the international uh, cooperation, uh, we, could, uh, we could proceed. And uh, I, uh, uh, I am sure that international cooperation helps to overcome uh, some difficulties uh, uh, that we can uh, meet. Uh, Every partner has uh, one, uh, once in his life uh, some difficulties, but the partnership helps to overcome this uh, difficulty. Thank you, Jack. Uh, yes, uh, UN COPAS uh, is, uh, you know, uh, fostering such uh, international cooperation as, uh, you know, uh, most important uh, goals uh, for the human being. Do you have anything to add? Again, I can just... Uh, confirm what uh, Jean-Jacques said, especially in unstable situations, especially in unstable situations, how to proceed without international cooperation. I mean, this is, this is the best way you can do. And uh, it's financially, it's also what Jean-Jacques said from the um, commitment of the different states, but it's also from a technological point of view, it makes sense. We have different competencies in the world and the different countries. So to merge them, to come to a, a common project is, uh, in the case after the Cold War, the only logic we can follow. Yes, uh, Mr. Kozawa-san. Yes, uh, same as in the domestic programs, the, once the international cooperation program has started, it's very hard to stop it. And so sometimes we have some uh, you know, patience uh, to listen from the other partners uh, about the budget situations or technical situations. And so the uh, most important matter, I think, uh, during the international cooperation in space area is the uh, daily communications among the international partners. Something happened in domestically, it's easy to make a phone call to the uh, other partners, heads, or uh, key persons, and explain the situations and to get understandings. This is very important. Otherwise, very hard to you know, keep the uh, international programs. Uh, my talk is the, uh, our, from the, uh, our experiences. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kozawa-san. I have one specific question uh, from the floor. Uh, there is obviously international collaboration on Orion with the multi-purpose crew vehicle. Should we expect to see more collaboration on this program from other countries and regions? Is the international community interested in using the Orion to send astronauts further into space or more interested in, in investing in their own systems? 
about Mr. Uh, Jack uh, Dolan, uh, do you have any comments on this? We are in, huh? Yes. Barack, we are yes. in. So we should ask our Japanese colleagues. Yes. The, the, <laughs> yes. Uh, ESA is part of uh, the Orion, so yeah. I think that it's already done. So it's maybe to the others to, uh, yes. to come, and starting by the Japanese. <laughs> It's at this moment we have no relations with Orion programs, but uh, I think to look at the uh, transportation system, to the, especially human transportation systems, to the space, a uh, space station, and further. At this okay, at this moment that uh, we are now in a very uh, you know unstable you know situations in the human transportation systems, and so in that meaning is that uh, we have the uh, more different, you know, uh, 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 type of the uh, human spacecraft systems in the world, this is provide, this is, this will be provided a more flexible situations for the human space programs. So we welcome the arrivals. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kozawa-san. Now we uh, approach to the end of this panel uh, to conclude this panel discussion. I would like to express my appreciation to the leaders of space agencies for your participation and contribution to this panel. I believe our discussion was very fruitful and wish you all for the continued success in each of your agencies. Please give the big hand to all the panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you to our panel of space agency leaders. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now take a short afternoon refreshment break co-sponsored today by ATK.